Hey, this is Andrew Kuhn, and you're listening to the Focus Compounding Podcast, the podcast where Jeff and I talk about actionable stock ideas, timeless investing concepts, and the overall way that we think about investing at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Go to focuscompounding.com and enter in your email to get a free watch list from Jeff every other week. And be sure to check out all of our other work where Jeff writes about stocks at focuscompounding.com. I upload how-to investing videos on YouTube, and we both manage capital for investors at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe to follow along. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focused Compounding, sitting next to Jeff Gannon, back again here today on the number one value investing podcast in the world, soon to be the number one YouTube value investing channel in the world as well, and on our way to being the number one educators on the internet when it comes to value investing. Jeff, how's it going today? Uh, good. How's it going with you? It is going good. We hope it's going good for everybody else as well. Hey, if this is the first time that you are tuning in with us, I'm just going to pull the screen up right now. This is focuscompounding.com. If you're watching on YouTube, you want to become a premium member? Click join now. Become a premium member. If you want to join the famous Gannon Gazette to get a free 2,000 word stock write up in every single email, um, enter in your email right there. No um, sort of payment needed, no obligation. And whenever we send out a last email, you will get a free write-up, and that is the famous Gannon Gazette. If you want to read about ideas and you are a member and you want to read about Jeff's ideas, click Jeff Gannon, and you'll get a bunch of different ideas from Jeff Gannon. If this is the first time that you are tuning with us on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button, thumbs this video up. We are going to take over this YouTube channel area. Uh, we're trying to hack the algorithm, so leave us a, uh, a comment. Hit that thumbs up button. That helps a lot. We are pumping out ton of content, a ton of free content, and we're very happy uh, if you are going to follow along with us. So in today's podcast and video, we're going to be going over a 10K on a bank. Okay. We uploaded a 10K video recently, and that got a ton of engagement, and a lot of people asked us if we could go through a 10K of a bank. So I figured, let's do it. So if you're watching on YouTube, if not, we're going to try and make this also interactive for people on the podcast side, because mm -hmm. we don't want to upset anybody. Uh, go to uh, sec.gov. Obviously, this is where you get all the company filings. You could do the fast search. If you know the ticker, we are going to be going over Frost. And this is a stock. Jeff's long report of singular diligence is on the Focus Compounding website. Obviously, this is a very, uh, I think you're probably one of the first guys to start writing about this company. And whenever I see a thread of Colin Frost, uh, the stock, your name always comes up because of your long report on yeah, it. That's probably the longest. Yeah. I imagine. Um, this one's very nice. Yeah. So we're going to go through a 10K of it. So you go to SCC.gov, you mm -hmm. type in the ticker, and this is where it'll bring you. You type in filing type, you can type in 10K, and bam, mm -hmm. the most recent 10K they just filed was February 4th, 2020. Documents. Click this. It's an interactive one. Ugh, I hate this. And let's go through it. Okay. Colin Frost Bankers, Inc. Form 10. Okay. Right. So a couple things that quickly stand out. Obviously, we like to see where the headquarter is. Yes. Um, this business, if you're familiar with it, do, they do pretty much all their business in Texas. Mm -hmm. Their headquarters is in San Antonio, Texas. Obviously, that makes sense. Um, you can see what the ticker is. What other things stand out to you? Okay. So they have two forms of securities. So this is very typical for a bank. There's a non-cumulative perpetual preferred stock series a that you can see there and you could actually find that it probably trades it does trade in the new york stock exchange um that's probably not that interesting as a security but it's done for regulatory purposes because of how they're allowed to count that so banks will often have some form of uh preferred stock and uh so that you'll see that listed with the common stock and so i always look at that obviously for other stocks that aren't banks it would be things like you know with different voting rights and stuff right this one the important thing to look at is it's incorporated in texas that's gonna be pretty normal for a bank to be incorporated in this state in which they're actually doing their uh, banking. So you're going to see that more so than like Delaware or something like that, like you would with other companies. Yeah. And we also see San Antonio. And as we'll get into this, this bank um, where we live in the Dallas Fort Worth area has very low market share, but it has very high market share in places like San Antonio. So this is the, the biggest Texas based bank in Texas. And um, yet we're going to see that it's kind of uh, regional in terms of the location. So mm -hmm. there's like four big cities in Texas and it's big in a couple of, it's big in one of them and it's expanding into a couple others it's not really expanding into this area so we are in texas but we don't know this bank 
locally that well. Yeah. And um, for everybody listening, we do spend a lot of time in the FDIC call reports, mm-hmm. but people did ask specifically to go through the 10K. So we'll do another podcast on that, actually going mm-hmm. through the call reports, what it means and everything like that. Because I mean, banks are great because you can get way more information and learn way more information about them than you could in any any company yeah, from, should, from the FDIC reports. Yeah, we should point that out. So it, all companies that are um, SEC reporting are going to file 10Ks, whether they're banks or not. But for most companies that don't file t- uh, 10Ks, you don't have that much information about them. For banks, they're still going to file with the FDIC, even if they don't file with the SEC. So you're going to have, you know, a, quote unquote, dark banks mm-hmm. that actually provide tons of information. And we'll show you that in the episode we do on the call report. Mm-hmm. And my one question to you is what are the main things you're looking for when you're looking at a bank? Like what stands out to you? Uh, deposits is what I'm looking for. Okay. Mm-hmm. And like, what about that? Like the quality the, of the deposits? Yeah. The quality and the cost of the deposits, which we can get into, mm-hmm. um, and, and things like that. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So obviously trades on the New York stock exchange mm-hmm. market cap was 5.6 billion. As of January 29th, there were 62 million they shares outstanding for us. This because is it's an interactive one, so this yeah, helps it's great. The whole other it's wonderful. Over, yeah, <laughs> we would obviously yeah. highlight all of this. Some of it, and yeah. you would take Not note of. Value, no, but the yeah. shares outstanding. The shares outstanding. Yeah. yeah, risk factor. Okay. All right, Colin Frost Bankers Inc., a Texas-based corporation, incorporated in 1977, is a financial holding company and a bank holding company headquartered in San Antonio, Texas, that provides through subsidiaries a broad array of products and services throughout numerous Texas markets. Um, you know, it's pretty much talking about uh, the business. At December 31st, 2019, Colin Frost had consolidated total assets of $34 billion mm-hmm. and was the largest independent bank holding companies headquartered in the state of Texas. Right. And what's interesting right here is they go right into their philosophy. Our philosophy yeah. is to grow and prosper, building long-term relationships based on top quality service, high ethical standards, and safe, sound assets. Yeah. And then they talk about the locally oriented uh, thing because that's their big thing is that they're Texas. And that's something that's a common theme. If you're familiar with Jeff, I think you really like a lot of more regional Mm -hmm. type banks as opposed to you're not, you know, I don't know if you've ever, I don't think you've invested in like a JP Morgan or like a Bank of America or a Wells Fargo. You're very much focused on like targeted markets and stuff like that. Like when it comes to geography and stuff. Right. And we'll get into like um, how it's easier to understand this. Although they talk about that they do consumer banking services, trust and investment management, insurance brokerage, all that stuff up there in the um, third line of the first paragraph under the corporation. Yeah. No, I was yeah. just kind of. Okay. Um, they, uh, they really are much simpler. They're commercial and consumer bank basically mm-hmm. in Texas. Um, the other stuff is very small for them. So when we get into banks like JP Morgan, Bank of America, the problem there is they're really like four or five different kinds of banks mixed in together. So there's like an investment bank. There's mm-hmm. like a bank that's doing like corporate finance stuff, which is more like wholesale type stuff. You're not going to get a better deal lending to a fortune 500 type company than someone who will offer a lower rate and stuff. You know, it's not, it's much more transactional, that kind of business, more like hot money type stuff. Yeah. And so, and then they're like syndicating things. They're doing all sorts of stuff Mm -hmm. and they're, um, but when you're dealing more with, uh, and then they'll have like a, part of them, which is essentially like a national community bank type thing. Like, um, that that's more what people are familiar with when they think of bank of America, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo. If you bank with them, you're probably thinking more of the one that serves households or small businesses and things mm-hmm. like that. And that just kind of competes more like on the same level as frost or something in Texas that has much higher returns than some of the other things. And is less cyclical than say an investment bank or something mm-hmm. like that. Right. Um, so talking about, you know, you said one of the most important things you care about is the deposits, right? Mm-hmm. So the type of deposits. So you have a bank, you deposit money in there. What what type of capital is that? Um, they say our customer base is, is diverse right here. And then they go on to talk about their loan portfolio and says that it has significant yeah. concentration of energy related loans, totaling 11.2% of total loans at December 31st, 2019. We are not dependent upon any single industry or customer. Right. So I'd highlight that because they did point it out. Um, so that means they have a concentration in energy. Now, one thing that's easy for people to overlook, though, is that if you have a concentrate of exactly the wording they used, they said 11% of their total loans. Mm-hmm. Well, it depends on the bank, but as we'll see here, Frost's balance sheet isn't all loans. So 11% of loans might only be 5 to 6% or, or, you know, in that area of the total um, assets of the bank because the other part will be securities. So then you think about that. So you think, okay, well, what if they lose 100% of one out of every five loans? 
loans that they make in energy or something, right? Mm-hmm. That could just be 1% of assets. Be, because as we do the math on that, you'll see that that's not such a huge number. But I would highlight that right away because they talked about a concentration level um, and you know learn about that. That's not that weird, of course, because they're in Texas and Texas has some bigger energy companies and things. Mm-hmm. Got it. Okay, so now they're talking about subsidiaries of Colin Frost, Frost Bank. Frost Insurance Agency, Inc. Uh, I would highlight the 142 financial centers across Texas. Yeah. In Austin, Corpus Christi, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, that whole thing that they talk about. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And I'd also highlight the number of ATMs and stuff. The other thing they give information about is the bank and like when it's been around for. Mm -hmm. So one thing I should point out, this is all banks are going to have this. This said something about 1977 or something. Yeah. But that's for like legal purposes. The thing you're investing in is a bank holding company, which is not actually the bank itself. It's the same as when you invest in like a insurance company. Um, You don't actually invest in the insurance subsidiary. You invest in like Berkshire Hathaway or something, which owns something, which is the regulated entity. The same thing here. They're the bank holding company. So they're going to say that they were incorporated in 1977 or whatever they said. And here they say something about the 1899. But in reality, the this bank dates back to right after the Civil War. Um, so it's actually from, I think, the 1860s, the predecessor. Which is obviously very important when thinking about a bank and brand loyalty and stuff like mm-hmm. the mind share, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And they started down in the San Antonio yeah. area. Yeah. yeah. So they talk about other types of yeah. Uh, this is very business important. offered, commercial yeah. banking, consumer right. services. So maybe we should just highlight these and talk about them because yeah. in general. So first of all, they're in the correct order. So I'd say Frost's the most important business for them is commercial banking because they go by revenue. Uh, yeah, but I mean, in terms of the value of the bank, I would value commercial banking number one, consumer services number two for them. The reason for commercial banking being the most important, I'd say, for Frost is because they both take in deposits from. Um, businesses, but then they also lend to them. Whereas on the consumer side of it, while they take in a lot of money from them, we'll see the deposits, they don't really do a lot of lending to consumers as compared to most banks. So the way I think of them is like, they're basically have, um, a business that's half commercial. They're doing both sides of it, but then the consumer side, it's really just the deposits they bring in and they buy like state um, of Texas bonds, things like that. And we'll see that. So they do a lot less in consumer than most banks would. Uh, They also break down other things. There's the international banking one. That's just because of like, um, uh, where they're located. Mm-hmm. Basically, there's cross-border stuff with Mexico that happens. Um, also, cro- uh, also, Frost acts as a correspondent bank. Oh, they have that next. Yeah, correspondent banking. Correspondent yeah. banking. Which is interesting. So maybe, um, can you read that section for just so people understand? Yeah, correspondent, correspondent banking. banking. Frost Bank acts as a correspondent for approximately 184 financial institutions, which are primarily banks in Texas. These banks maintain deposits with Frost Bank, which offers them a full range of services, including check clearing, transfer of funds, fixed income security services, and security custody and clearance services the only thing i'd really say about that is in general the the whale yeah in general a bank that acts as a corresponding bank like that in an area probably knows more about the um situation that most banks are in than other banks would um for instance i think it doesn't hurt you in getting a good knowledge of what kind of banks you might want to merge with sure and what what banks are looking to merge and doing things like that just because you you might have a little i I think it's not unusual for them when they look at a target to merge with in texas that they acted as their correspondent Mm -hmm. trust services capital markets Mm -hmm. they do do a little capital market stuff if you've ever looked i have seen um filings and stuff long time ago of some public companies in texas that did use frost as like their um investment bank essentially to do certain um uh, stock and bond mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. Okay. Got more stuff. What they do operating segments, competition. Yeah, that's good. So all, you know, boilerplate stuff, supervision and regulation. That's good. At the end, uh, the last line of competition, the last, or the last two lines, the, the last, um, we sentence. generally compete. Yeah. We generally compete on the basis of customer service and responsiveness to customer needs, availability, loan and deposit products, the rate of interest charge on loans, the rate of interest paid for funds and availability and pricing of trust brokerage and insurance services. So that gives some guesses without us knowing much about the bank. Um, the first things they mentioned, were customer service and responsiveness to customer things. And that just matches the image that you're going to get from other things in this 10K. And the stuff they put at the end was pricing and availability of trust brokerage and insurance stuff, which sounds like they're not very involved in actually doing much of that. It's just that 
um, they probably don't want their customers to go somewhere else. For yeah. It. Um, and then they, the middle part with the rates and what they pay and what they charge is, you know, normal stuff mm. that they would say in all cases. And banks are good businesses. I mean, going back to customer service and responsiveness to customer needs. And I know we've spoken a lot about Frost, how mm -hmm. there's high switching costs, right? So when you right. sign up with a bank, it's kind of a, a pain in the butt to, mm -hmm. you know, move to a different bank. And maybe you have like your mortgage through that bank and, um, you know, brokerage services and all this other stuff. So it's like, they got you, right? Unless yeah. they really mess up. And I know you've talked about Frost before, how they focus in the first year entirely on the new customer for the yeah. first year. And then they know like if it's a good experience for the first year, they found that like they got you for life. Yeah. So they, I know that Frost has a, uh, like, a. I think they call it onboarding uh, part to their business. That's probably a little more aggressive than some uh, banks are. So banks have a total retention rate thing that they give information on. Sometimes some banks do, and it's very high. It tends to be about at the level of an insurance company or higher. So it can be like 90% sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, however, it's heavily weighted to how seasoned the business is. So it, that first year is when you could lose a lot. So mm -hmm. there are banks that probably lose a third of their customers that they sign up in the first year. But once they get them to say year three or something, then they have retention except in the case of like you move away, you die, you mm -hmm. get divorced, that kind of thing. Other than that, they tend to keep them. And in fact, the the um, it takes longer to win business um, customers for banks but they usually keep them even longer mm -hmm. than people yeah sure okay there's a bunch of stuff in here that you know you would look at but it's not that interesting it's going to be typical of um, how banks work if you haven't read it before this will be interesting the regulatory stuff about it who they're regulated by uh, capital measures that they need to have um, the one thing that you should know because it's in here is uh, that we haven't talked about before is that you're not really going to have activists involved in banks generally because of the difficulties of influencing the bank mm -hmm. um, because of uh, restrictions on it as a regulated entity sort of the same as like a utility thing. Mm -hmm. Dividends and stock repurchases. Mm -hmm. So it talks about the, this is the structure that can be confusing to people. Cullen Frost is the thing that you're investing in, but they have a um, banking subsidiary they call Frost Bank. And in fact, that's what's paying out uh, to them. Same as insurance company. Like they have a surplus on that that they're able to then pay out. So they get regulated at that level. And then if they um, have capital above a certain level, they may be able to pay it out. And they talk about that down there. They say could pay aggregate dividends of approximately 682.9 million. Mm -hmm. Um, so th th before they would need government approval. Um, so basically it just gives you an idea of the capital, you know, as long as um, the amount of capital they would be able to pay out. They're not going to pay that out on dividends, but like a company investing that it's a non-financial company mm -hmm. doesn't have a regulator telling them you can only pay out $683 million right now. You yeah. know? And to your point about not being activists in banks and stuff like that, they're going a little bit over here. Federal mm -hmm. law also permits a bank's authority to extend credit to its directors, executive officers, Officers at 10% stockholders. Okay, so they didn't go to, I thought they were going to talk about how once you cross over what 10% of a bank, it's like mm -hmm. a different uh, regulatory process for like filing Generally, and stuff no like that. Gonna yeah, no one's going to do it. That's why even like Buffett, right? He would yeah. own like nine point. I, I mean, I've seen it happen, but it's usually to like recapitalize the bank or some sort of special deal that that's um, everyone's okay with. It doesn't really happen. Um, uh, just someone's slowly buying up over 10% or something. Yeah. You're not going to see that. Uh, the one thing that is interesting about that is sometimes they disclose some things about insiders and things because of what you just said. So sometimes you, for really small banks, it can be helpful. You do find out some information about them and who they extend loans to and mm -hmm. who, who has so many assets and stuff with the bank. It's not going to matter in the case of Frost, though. Mm -hmm. Okay, capital requirements. This gets pretty complicated. So if people don't know how this works, there's a um, approach to capital stuff where they use... Um, this is Basel III that they're talking about here, um, which is uh, capital rules um, that work on a whole basis of how well capitalized a bank is. Generally, you're going to be reading about the bank and they're going to say that, that they are well capitalized, explain how far above the capital uh, amounts that they need to have and things like that. It gets into details here about things like minimum ratio of common equity tier one. We'll get into maybe more of like how I would look at whether the bank's adequately capitalized and things like that. A lot of write-ups and things will focus on the regulatory stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily 
care as much about that. I don't think that's sufficient um, as an investor in the common stock to really think about that. This is really to protect depositors and things like that. I mean, there's also the FDIC to protect them. But I mean, it, it's protecting the overall financial system to have banks that are mm-hmm. capitalized this well. But what's going to matter more to us as an investor is whether they're, you know, basically ability to grow dividends as fast or faster than earnings mm-hmm. and things like that. So we'll talk about that, I guess. Okay, liquidity requirements, going back into that. Mm-hmm. So there's more stuff related to that. A lot of these are similar that you'll see in almost every uh, bank. bank account. Account. Yeah. Cybersecurity, to be fair, is like every company that talks about cybersecurity, it does actually matter to banks and mm-hmm. things like that. So, you know, it is more relevant. They talk about how many employees they have. Um, so that'd be useful. I would divide that number by the number of branches and things like that. So I think they said they have 4,600 employees. We know that they have a hundred and what do they say? 140 some, um, yep. 148, something like that, mm-hmm. um, branches. So we would divide those numbers and, and see things like that to get an idea. A of, general picture. Yeah, yeah. Of how big they might be per branch, things like that. Um, <clears throat> this is gonna be pretty extensive usually. Uh, banks tend to have a lot of people with titles like vice president. They yeah. usually have a ton of vice presidents. Um, some of these are also uh, going to be of the bank. Uh, uh, instead of the bank holding company, we might see someone who is related to the bank. So Frost Bank is actually a different entity. So you see that there. So you might see like president of Frost, Frost Bank. The one that is imp- uh, important probably in terms of a title in ter- compared to different from anything else you're going to see that might matter is the president of the actual bank. But Mm -hmm. other than that, I wouldn't, you know, this is just typical stuff. You would also want to look at their ages and stuff. This is very typical. They tend to be, uh, probably closer (laughs) in, in age to each other. Yeah. Older. Um, Been in the business for a while, right? Yeah. But not there. Look, there's no one on there who's very old, Mm -hmm. um, either. There's not many who are very young. Okay. Risk related to the business. Feel mm-hmm. free. We always read all that. Uh, some of these do matter. So let's see. Let's go. Our, our profitability depends on significantly our yeah, economic let's go condition. Back to the state top of Texas. And go through slowly through the risk stuff, and we'll get an idea. Okay. So we are subject to risks from fluctuating conditions in the financial true, markets and economic and political is, conditions we'll generally. Okay. The second one might matter depending on the bank. So they say here the useful information here is the next paragraph where they say as of December thirty first, twenty nineteen, approximately eighty eight percent of our loan port. Portfolio consisted of commercial and industrial energy, construction and commercial real estate, mortgage loans, that part. Yeah. Um, that part is going to be, uh, you know, you'll get information on the bank from each one from that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would definitely read that paragraph as important. Um, they talk about they're subject to interest rate risks. There'll be a whole section on that in a bank that we'll get to. Um, they talk about LIBOR, which is... Uh, a reference rate, basically. Um, uh, so you've probably seen it as how um, if you invest in a lot of companies where you see that they're borrowing at LIBOR plus, plus something. something. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It, and it goes into detail about what LIBOR is, at least. Yeah. You know, and not even just reading about it, you could learn more about, like, um, from the borrower's perspective, knowing more about banking might help you understand that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Um, our allowance for loan losses may be insufficient. Let's see if they give any details about that. No, they don't. Um, sometimes they give details about how they uh, make the allowances and things like that. So they see, see here where they talk about the determination of the yes. level of the allowance and all that. Banks do it different ways. We'll see if there's sections in there. Sometimes they can apply their own historical experience. Sometimes they can use historical experience of peers in uh, because they don't have enough themselves. Sometimes they can classify things in sort of buckets or apply to specific loans. There's all sorts of things that they can mm-hmm. talk about how they do it. Our profitability depends significantly on economic conditions in the state of Texas. Yes. The important one that I would say here is where they have this one where it says, moreover, approximately 99.7% of securities in our uh, municipal bond portfolio um, are subdivisions of the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. A significant decline in general economic conditions in Texas, whether caused by recession, inflation, unemployment changes, or prolonged stagnation in oil prices, changes in security markets, acts of terrorism, blah, 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 would Mm -hmm. affect them. So, I mean, that's important. I wouldn't worry about it because I'm not a credit analyst, but I think that the securities they own in the state of Texas are much safer than most municipal securities and things like that. And we could get into why that is, but you could look at the securities and what they are. Texas, these, these I think, are very safe securities in Texas in mm-hmm. general. I think it's a safe state. What about this line? We are subject to volatility risk yes. in crude oil prices. That is true. So they talk about their energy loans, and I don't know if they talk about how they do it, but the price per barrel later on, so like we said, 11% of their... Loans have to do with energy loans, and a lot of those have to do with um, 
uh, like producing wells. They don't have mm-hmm. to do with just things like pipelines and stuff like that, which would be less sensitive to crude oil prices. Mm-hmm. So that's important. Um, the, they are subject to risks from the commercial real estate world. And let's see, what do they talk about there? They talk about how much of it. There'll be a whole section where they break down how much of their loans fall into each of these categories, but they're doing a good job of like breaking down what sort of things you would look at anyway. And this is all, loans. it's all good information to, to get this out of the call report. So we'll definitely do frost mm-hmm. when we go through that because they break it all down. Okay. Um, let's see. They talk about fintech and all that in that section. I don't really care that much about that. Um, most of this is standard stuff. Um, Uh, so here we go. So the value of our goodwill. I don't care if they write down the goodwill and stuff, but it's significant that they have um, purchased banks we know from this paragraph mm-hmm. at very large um, premiums to book. Yeah, uh, so it's so four happened. four billion dollar market cap, right? Yeah, and um, we have six hundred fifty seven million of goodwill and other intangible assets. So yeah, the market cap can't be that small, can it? No, what is it? Is that what it said at the beginning? Uh, well, they gave us okay five five point eight seven okay billion. Yeah. So um, that, hmm. So that's ninety three dollars. Well, it's quite a bit cheaper than I thought it was going to be. Hmm. Okay. Not the stock price, but actually, given the size of the balance sheet now, this yeah. might be cheaper than I thought. Um, so, and we'll get into that. But they talk a little bit about the, if their balance sheet is really what did they say? They said thirty four billion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And their market cap is only six billion. Yeah. Mm, we'll get into that. That's very cheap. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Okay. And then um, these are all standard things. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't highlight much of any of these. Uh, Just It's all good information to know. I mean, potential acquisitions may disrupt our business and dilute stockholder value. Like, I guess that's mm-hmm. any public company, right? I guess it's good that they're saying that. But, I mean, it's just good to read all this stuff. Mm-hmm. We're subject to liquidity risk. Yep, you can keep going. This we may not be able to attract and retain skilled people. Yeah. Uh, wait, go up a little bit. Um, hold on. Uh, our operations, our operations rely on certain external vendors. Okay. Um, so this isn't that interesting, except that. Um, I would be curious uh, who those are and stuff just in general in banking. We have some ideas who they're talking about and stuff, but um, it, it, it's true that banks use a significant amount of uh, outsourced a significant amount of stuff to other people. Um, all right. And you keep going. These are a lot of risks. This is the problem with any bank thing. Mm-hmm. And this is not a tiny bank. So Severe weather, natural disasters. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Stock could be volatile. All stock things say that. Trading volume. We could skip that. Um, yeah. We're okay, good. cool. Okay. Properties. Okay. They're headquartered in downtown San Antonio, Texas. That would be interesting to me. And then they talk about what cities are in. I would definitely highlight that. Their primary market areas, uh, Austin, Corpus, Christi, Dallas, Fort Worth, um, those sorts of things. Houston, the Permian. Yes, they bought a bank there. So, um, and then we get into things like stock repurchase, which is not significant. Uh, this everyone loves this chart; it's their favorite yeah. thing. Uh, so it gives you an idea. So one thing is interesting is that you can see here that the bank has. So what you starts with one hundred in twenty fourteen. So over the last yeah. five years, how did Frost do versus the S and P five hundred? It underperformed. And how did it do versus S and P uh, banks? It- Drastically, not drastically, but um, hundred dollars went to one hundred fifty nine in Colin Frost, and one hundred went to one hundred seventy three in S and P, and one hundred went to one hundred eighty in S and P five hundred banks. Yep. So, so it underperformed quite a bit. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that it seems to be related to the decline in twenty fifteen or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the, here's the income statement, and um, it we have for the last summary of the last five years from the income statement. Yeah. And then we just look at what is significant. Um, I would say, so we have, um, their interest income. We have the non-interest items. Um, we have, uh, loans, including fees, securities. So they're making yeah. money on securities and so on. So, um, 
what I would be interested in is they have uh, basically the net non-interest expense. So you take the non-interest expense that they have, um, which you can see down here. So like in 2019, the um, total non-interest expense was, let's say, $834 million. Mm -hmm. um, And then you net that out against you have their like – uh, the total non-interest income was like 360 million or something. So you would net that out in your mind there and get like 470 million or something, just roughly. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's less than half a billion dollars. And then that compares to how much their um, their deposits and things like that will get to, which will will when we see the balance sheet items. Um, so that that's stuff that we take and then we apply the balance sheet, which we'll do in a second. Mm -hmm. The actual income statement alone without the balance sheet of bank, I don't find useful. I need to see both of them together. Performance ratios, these are important. Mm -hmm. So this is probably the easiest one for people to look at. What stands out to me here immediately is um, the the high um, return on average assets. Yeah, and what's what, what's considered high for banks, would you say? It depends on the interest rate environment, but anything that's earning 1% or higher now is, is fine. It's good, yeah. And anything that's earning close to 2% is incredibly high. Um, there have been periods in the past, though, where 2% isn't that weird. Um, so most banks are going to be looking at probably don't earn much better than that. It's interesting just to see how high it has been in uh, recent years. The other thing they can do immediately is divide two numbers into each other, which is more what I care about in terms of leverage ratios and things like that. So return on average common equity divided by return on average assets, what you're seeing there. So like, for instance, you can see that if they were levered 10 to 1, then they you could move that decimal point one over. So they should have a 13.6% return on equity in 2019. What did they really have? 12.24. Mm -hmm. The year before, they should have had at 14.4%. They actually had 14.23%. The year before that, you know, you can do the math. Mm -hmm. And so each time you can see in the past, they've tended at least for the last three or four years to be at a leverage ratio of 10 times or less, meaning that each... Uh, point of their return on average assets converts to about 10 times that in terms of return on average equity. I think that's fine. It's uh, an appropriate level, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not aggressive. So I, I t just in my head, I would always think like when I don't know how capitalized a bank is and stuff, that 10 times or something as a round number makes a lot of sense that you multiply the average asset, the average ROA times 10. That's probably what the bank is like capable of earning all the time while mm -hmm. having... Um, adequate adequately capitalized that they're not doing anything dangerous but that you could run it that way banks that are running much less than 10 times are probably running a little more conservatively than they need than they need to be got it okay so we have some balance sheet data loans earning assets total assets mm -hmm. the ones that would be important here is the asset quality that's what i care a lot about so and total deposits so total deposits we have here um under the balance sheet data mm -hmm. uh, total deposits there you can see is um 27 uh that was at the end date so period end so 27.6 um billion um they also break down the non-interest bearing deposits and the interest bearing deposits so that's interesting um the non-interest bearing deposits are pretty high that's over 30 percent well, it's over 33 percent we can you know do the math and see that mm -hmm. so it's probably between you know closer to 40 percent or something um that's a high number and just gives us an idea that they're Deposit quality is probably good that way. Uh, it's probably like more relationship based and stuff, probably coming from the commercial side. Um, you also can see loans and do in your head the ratio of loans to deposits and see it's not that big. So mm -hmm. 14 divides into 27, about 50. Mm -hmm. So about 50%. So it's about half a balance sheet that's all about loans and the other half is about um, securities. They have this item called earning assets and you'll hear me refer to earning assets sometimes. Basically what we mean is that's the bank's balance sheet um, that's the part that's supported by deposits generally. You can see in the case of Frost, if you do the math, 27 um, billion, we're just going to truncate those numbers to make it easy to work with. So 27 billion in deposits versus 29 billion in earning assets means their deposits are basically covering like 10, um, about 90% of their balance sheet and mm -hmm. the rest is probably shareholders equity and we'll see that when we look yeah and you see shareholders that. equity is four billion yeah. so if you add those two together that's 31 so you can see they're not really using other forms of um de uh, you know debt and things mm -hmm. like that they're financed basically just through deposits deposits in fact we can just very easily see their non-interest bearing demand deposits we could assume to be very sticky probably there it's about 11 billion of those and they have and about what is that non-interest bearing demand deposits for people that don't know it's checking accounts that don't pay um mm -hmm. interest basically um so 
the uh, that's 11 billion, and then we have shareholders' equity of 4 billion. That's 15 billion, which is more than half of the uh, balance sheet. Um, so more than half the balance sheet is probably in extremely safe sorts of things. I would just expect that non-interest bearing demand deposits are stuff that aren't going to flow out of the bank at all, and uh, shareholder equity certainly isn't. That's permanent mm-hmm. capital, so it's just a very stable way of financing a bank mm-hmm. so far. Yeah, yeah. From asset we, quality. Yeah, so this is where they give information about loan losses and charge offs. So we should probably explain this because it's a little confusing. Banks use allowance for loan losses the same way that when you look at like um, uh, uh, receivables, receivables, yeah, right. So you're normally looking at receivables at a non financial company. And you're seeing that it's net of an allowance. Well, they use an allowance all the time at banks, but because this is such a big item on like receivables for them, um, it matters a lot. And so the actual numbers they're reporting to you on an income statement basis, like what they say they earned, are affected a lot by what that allowance is. And we can see the allowance has been pretty similar. They've allowed between 0.9%, I guess, in the most recent year and 1.1% or something. Yeah. yeah, is that right? One point two percent. So um, the the allowance for loans to the the year end loans, and then but we then look at the actual charge off. So if we just read across, why don't you read the starting the furthest year back, um, what the allowance was, and then read underneath it what the actual charge off was. Yeah, allowance one hundred thirty five point eight million. Uh, just the percentage. Oh, I'm sorry, one point one eight percent, one point two eight percent. No, that and then the one below it. So like versus. Okay, got it. So one point one eight percent, and then they charged off um, fifteen point five million, and they had one point two eight percent and thirty four point four million, one point one eight percent, thirty three point one million, point nine four percent, forty four point eight million. Point nine zero percent, thirty three point seven million. Okay, so they basically, what they did is they had um, the first year back they did one point one eight percent allowance, and they charged off zero point one four. Is that? I can't uh, read that number. Oh right yeah, here. yeah, mm-hmm. right here. Okay, then the next year they they had an allowance for one point two. Can you read that number to me? Yeah, one point two eight and versus then zero point three zero. Right. Then the next year one point one eight point two seven. So they're not charging off what they're zero, doing then allowance was 0.94. for zero point nine four and then charge off point three three point nine zero point two three. And that's actually typical. So it's going to be typical for a bank to have in most years, I would say, allow way more than they charge off because their char- their charge offs are going to cluster in a bad period for the economy, mm-hmm. okay? And then they're gonna have high charge offs of a couple percent or something. So the idea of it is it smooths out the earnings by saying we're allowing for like 1% of loans are gonna go bad all the time, and then really you're closer to zero, and then you spike to two or 3% in those bad time periods. It can be sometimes other that their allowance is too great, and that could be what's happening mm-hmm. here. We don't know until we get into more detail. Then they have information about non-performing loans. Mm-hmm. So these are the total um, loans plus foreclosed assets. Sometimes they call it other real estate owned or something like the Oreo. Um, and uh, we're going to see how big that is as uh, versus their loans. So it's been between zero. Let's see. The, it peaked at 1.2% in the last five years. Yep. And the lowest point was 0.5 or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Is that yep, right? yep. So, again, that's in this sort of same level as their allowances. One thing you can compare to, or you could compare two different things. One, you could compare the charge-offs to the total loan, uh, the non-performing loans plus the foreclosed assets, right? So you could see that their charge-offs are lower than that. But you can also compare their allowance and see if their allowance, if they're allowing for all of the um, non-performing loans and the foreclosed assets and kind of compare them. Sometimes it's weird if the non-performing loans are very high and the charge-offs are very low. I've seen banks do fine with it and they may know things I don't. Mm -hmm. So like one bank I should have invested in didn't was a very small bank in uh, New Jersey, I think. And uh, I had been concerned for a very long time that they weren't charging off despite very high non-performing assets. Oh, wow. But it was out of the financial crisis and very slowly the loans um, did, they were able to have the loans come back to being performing things and stuff. It's a little more complicated, but there are things that are like construction things and stuff like that, bigger loans. um, And they may have known that they didn't need to charge them off and stuff. Most banks would be like a little more aggressive in charging it off quickly and then getting back to reporting good earnings. So instead they were kind of held back by it for a long time, but it kind of worried me why they weren't charging it off. Mm -hmm. Here they explicitly have the leverage ratio. And then they also have the risk-based ratios. Um, So the, the kind of ones that are sort of 
very easy to look at are the common equity tier one risk-based ratio, um, which is the first line you see. And what there. is that? So, <laughs> well, it's a risk-based one, so it's kind of complicated. So, like Frost has this weird thing that we've mentioned before, where they own a lot of securities, and the securities are actually state of Texas-backed securities, which wouldn't have the same risk-based rate uh, um, weighting as a federal security, despite the fact that I don't know how different. I'm not sure how different the risk of a Texas bond um, defaulting is than the risk of a U.S. bond, to be honest. Um, and I think that a Texas bond default is somewhat less likely, actually, than some European uh, sovereign debt. And we mentioned that before. So, like I was mentioning to you, the way that it works with like other um, banks in other countries and things might have like debt of Greece or something mm-hmm. or Portugal yeah. or whatever, and treat that as being. Uh, this is getting a little complicated because we're comparing different regulatory things, but they can almost. The, but they may treat that as being uh, less risky than say a Texas bond, where I don't actually believe that's the case. A good example of this is like we looked at um, Farmer Mac, yeah, mm-hmm. right. So Farmer Mac, because it's a government sponsored uh, enterprise, uh, it has a fairly good ratio for a bank to want to own. So they can own something that has a good yield on it, the debt of that kind of thing, and uh, still count it as being awfully similar to a state or federal um, sort of thing. So basically, if you owned a lot of bonds and things that would uh, of um, the U.S. government, that would get you the highest sort of percentages. And then if you own more risky things, you would have lower percentages there. So the, in theory, the higher, the better, if you want to think of it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, the higher, the more the more protected the depositors are. Not necessarily better for you because um, you want the leverage ratio to be appropriate. And we can see the leverage ratio, which I care more about down there. Um, a number closer to like 10 is probably more what you want to see than like five. Um, it's kind of hard to convert a return on assets for a bank. Like we said, like 1%. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine we're saying 1% to 2% is good. Yeah. Well, if their ratio is like five, uh, instead of 10, then that means my returns aren't that good. Mm -hmm. Right. So you want a good return on assets, but you also want some leverage there too. And, uh, these are kind of normal. Um, I would say for frost, those might be a little low, mm-hmm. but a lot of banks have been low coming on the financial crisis. Goes into the quarterly information. Mm-hmm. Good. Okay, I'm DNA. Mm-hmm. Results of operations. Yeah, so um, it gives you the return on average common equity mm-hmm. and the average shareholders equity average assets down at the bottom. You know, the earnings per share and the dividends per share, obviously, people care a lot about. But what I care about is, like I said, the return on assets and then the return on equity, um, which are high. I mean, especially for a bank yeah, that return is pretty sensitive 1. to interest rates. Yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty, pretty high. high. Yeah. Um, then here we go. So these are more of the kinds of things that we'd normally be looking at. Um, to see the type of deposits that they have. Yeah. Um, except I think that we will skip this section because this will be a little confusing to talk about to people. So if we get to something that's easier. Um, yeah, non-interest income. Uh, so they talk about the different sources of non-interest income. It varies depending on the bank. So they have what's typically one of the biggest one, which is going to be your trust investment and management fees. Service charges on deposit accounts can mean um, that you have a lot of deposits or that um, people are like having not sufficient fund fees and things like that. Yeah. Um, so that usually means a consumer part of the business. The top one that you're seeing there usually means they have some sort of like trust business and it gives you an idea of like their assets under management or something that basically they're charging that kind of fee. Um, the other stuff is typical that you see with almost all banks. They have some insurance stuff, interchange and debit um, stuff, but um, Mostly these are in line with a bank mm-hmm. that you'd expect. There, I'm not seeing much here that's extremely unusual just because you have to compare all this to the size of the bank. So trust and investment management fees, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, I have $126 million, but we just said the bank has $26 billion in deposits. That's not a very big number. Uh-huh. you know. So none of these charge things are that interesting. They talk about each one in detail, though, about like whether it went up or down, and they'll give you some information about why it would. Um, Debit so, card transaction fees. Right, and ATM service fees. We know they have a lot of ATMs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do they say? 
It's a lot. It's yeah. one of it. They might be second or something in Texas. It's very high. They're as high as some national banks and salaries and wages. Yeah. So that's interesting. And Jeff cares a lot about non-interest expense when it comes yeah. to banks. So non-interest expense is very important. Then we net that out. We already talked a little bit about that. One that I care a lot about too here is net occupancy. So rent, that's the third one there. And that is something that's very, um, there's certain things that you can get very, um, good economies of scale at a bank, yeah. right? And this is one that's very, um, in terms of a business model I would like to see, because banks can have very, very different ratios of occupancy cost to their uh, deposits. And so I always wanna see a very low occupancy cost level to deposits. And we actually talked about this in the, I don't know if we really got into it in the uh, report that I wrote on Frost, but it is pretty amazing over like 30 years how low that number could get as a percentage mm -hmm. because their their rent kept going down and down and down versus deposits, which is the kind of economies of scale that a bank can have that can be very attractive. So one thing that's hugely different between successful banks and unsuccessful banks is the percentage of their deposits that they have to pay out in rent. So you want that to be a low number versus a high number of deposits. So basically, if you compare occupancy over time, you want to see the, the occupancy costs going down down relative, they, you don't want to see them growing as fast as deposits. And that's a very powerful sort of, um, uh, operating leverage. In yeah, a yeah. Yeah. The last thing too to point out, just cause it's a accounting thing, the intangible amortization thing, banks have certain things that show up on their income statement. That's one. There's also a, they also how they amortize loan fees and things like that, um, which are non-cash things. And so you'll sometimes hear, Banks talk about on a cash flow basis. They really run their business on a cash flow basis, so they take out that sort of thing, and they know to do that. So sometimes they'll reference things in earnings calls and stuff, which are basically the cash interest coming off things and stuff, and not including amortization. And um, this, in this case, this is amortization that has to do with like um, their intangible amortization. They get that this bank has acquired other banks. Result of segment operations. Yeah. And so basically it's just a bank. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the other parts are significant. It can be different for... Sources and use of funds. Yes. So they just break it yep. down in different ways. And they break way. it down in percentage, which is very useful. So mm -hmm. you can see already I had mentioned that their non-interest ones are high, and they are. Um, they... Uh, they use a little bit of other stuff that I don't know if we want to get into exactly what they are. Federal funds purchased and repurchased agreements uh, are basically... It's a very small item, so it's not something that you need to care about. Um, the things I would focus on are the non-interest bearing uh, deposits, the interest bearing deposits, and the equity capital that they mm -hmm. have. Those are longer term sources. And then it shows you what they go into. Here are the two things that I would care a lot about are how much of their deposits are interest bearing, how much are non-interest bearing, and then also their loans and their securities. So you can see loans and securities have often been about 40% or something. And then, um, so I've said half and half. The reason I've been saying half and half is because the other part of it is the federal funds sold resale agreements and interest bearing deposits, that part. I kind of exclude that part generally um, on both sides of the balance sheet. I don't think it's that important. It's a short-term kind of thing that we don't want to get into exactly what it is, but um, it's just not important. It's kind of, a uh, everything a bank is doing is kind of cash-based, but that's the closest thing to just cash that mm -hmm. a bank has, yeah. Loans, obviously we care a lot about this yes. type so of loans. It, they give, what's nice here is they give a breakdown of all this stuff. That's it's like looking at the call report. That it would be like, this is what we would break down anyway, and we'd calculate out the percentages. So um, they have commercial and industrial or CNI loans. They have commercial real estate loans. They have consumer real estate. And then they have uh, consumer and other are the categories that they break down. So we'll just go into it and see what ones stand out as being unusual. Um, some of these are not that unusual. So they're actually one of their very biggest categories is commercial mortgage. Not that weird for a um, commercial bank mm -hmm. in a state or something to have like 30% commercial mortgage loans. That's something that there's always a demand for the loans and stuff. So that's not a big deal at all. Their consumer loans are tiny compared to what banks normally are. Not, not all, but all banks are different, but they're very underexposed to real estate in uh, Texas, obviously, mm -hmm. because their home equity, like, first of all, well, do you, what do you notice about it? Do you notice anything unusual about their consumer real estate loans? Home equity loan, it's, it's just they're very small, right? And they're okay. very, very similar, but they're very small. What's missing? Um, I'm not sure. What? Home equity loans and home equity lines of credit are not um, home mortgage Mortgages, loans. yeah. Right. So they're not oh, making yeah, just things taking like, out equity. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what the other part is. That's probably a safer form of it, too, wouldn't you say? Yes, it's possible. There could be other reasons. 
um, for instance, why would you make home equity loans like that? Uh, one is you could be making them because let's say they're officers and owners and stuff of the businesses you're involved in. Mm -hmm. So they want to take out more money that way. Yeah. And stuff. They could be more relationship based that way. Um, Using right, for like, like the home equity stuff that you're doing is more of a broader picture of your overall financial situation than say the very commoditized mortgage sort of yeah. thing. Uh, mortgages are often like originated by one entity and then sold off quickly, right? Although there are non-conforming mortgages that we've seen some banks keep on their balance sheet, but it's just it's sold off small. to like Fannie Mae, right? Yeah. So sold off to other, yeah. So um, the thing that we're seeing here is that it's small, and that a lot of it is home equity stuff. So like the actual percentages of home equity isn't that small. I bet a lot of banks are making two to five percent or something of those, but just the total amount in. I mean, total amount in consumer, like here's consumer and other, that could be all sorts of things, but consumer, I mean, they may get into it, but consumer and other can be things like RV loans and they can be, um, uh, you know, all your auto things and stuff are under there, but it can be tons of different things. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a small item, right? We don't see credit card stuff there, do we? No. No, we don't see lots of things. So if you took all of the consumer real estate together, it's like 8%, plus the consumer stuff together with it, it's like 11%, right, of their loans. Their loans are only half their balance sheet. So that means that only like 5% of their balance sheet is consumer loans. That's small, um, especially considering that they get a lot of their deposits from consumers. So they're taking in way more from households than they're loaning back to households. That's all that I'm saying. It yeah, mm -hmm. no, if you look at too, uh, total energy, you see from mm -hmm. 2015, it was 1.7 billion. And then 2016, it was 1.3 billion. That mm -hmm. was the only one that shrunk from 2015 to 2016. Yep. And what shrank in it? Can you, what part of it shrank a lot? It was production. Yeah. yeah. So the thing that is definitely unusual production here, for people listening on the podcast side went from 1.2 billion to 971 million. Yeah. The thing that does stand out as unusually high. So there's two things. One is just um, a big part of their lending is commercial mortgage. I don't, I'm not necessarily worried about that or whatever. It's just big. It's a, it's a third of their loans, which is about 15% it's like buildings and stuff like that. Businesses, yeah, it can be yeah, all sorts all of things. Sort of right, yeah. The things that stand out to me as potentially like risky or things that I would worry about, not that I think they're risky now or that Frost is risky in their lending to them or whatever, but just they'd be areas that I put asterisks next to or whatever would be construction. So that's commercial real estate construction. That's 9% right now of mm -hmm. their loans. Then there's land, 2%. That can be very risky. If you see that bulging, that's something you don't want to see a lot of lending for just land. Um, and then the other one that I pay a lot of attention to is the production aspect of the energy. The service and the other, not as much. Now, to be honest, energy services is probably the part where they lose all the yeah, money. Right, yeah. um, it is In terms of like when there's a bust in oil, I would expect that like yeah. if you want to see what on this balance sheet could go completely wrong, I would say like maybe that's one way to think about it, right? So if you're looking at a bank and you're like what could just be disastrous for them yeah, the when I risk. see this is um, I would say these are not big items for Frost, but commercial real estate land Depending on the bank, if that's a big item or something, that could go to zero. Like you could, you could do bad loans in there that could go to like nothing. That could be a, an unusual and bad sort of outcome in a bubble in your local area or whatever. Um, the other part here that I would say is the service, energy services stuff, because they literally don't have cash flow in a um, in the bottom of the cycle, mm -hmm. right? So anything that doesn't have any cash flow coming off of it, the same thing as land, is a very scary thing to lend against. Production. It depends. We'd have to look at their earnings calls and stuff to decide how they price out, like how much to lend against a well and stuff like that. But I would guess the the production part of it would worry me less than the service part and the land. So service and land, I would be like, I can't evaluate these loans. They and they could go bad, and I don't know. Um, it's a small part of the balance sheet, right? Um, it's three percent yeah. loans, and mm -hmm. that's only half. So that's a one and a half percent of the balance sheet. The things that actually are bigger and unusual for them are energy production loans, nine percent, very big for a bank to ever be lending nine percent into energy production. And commercial mortgage, thirty one percent, is a big uh, amount for any mm -hmm. bank to be lending. But they are a commercial bank. That's what they do. Yeah. Um, Going so over they go it. into details about each of them, their energy loans, um, and then they go into like very specific detail about um, loans that are generally greater than ten million dollars. So like here, the bars typically have large capital requirements down there. Where? Right there. Yep. So let's such as greater than ten million. Right. But they go into extreme detail about saying for certain bar borrowers, collateral may include up to 20% proven non-producing reserves. So most of the have to be producing. Um, loan commitments are limited to 65% of estimated reserves. Uh, value. They talk about the cash flows. They talk about their base case and, you know, what. Yeah, so how they're doing their EBITDA. due diligence. Right, exactly. So that's, you won't get that for all sorts of loans they make, but for certain things, they will give detail on that. They give more detail on the energy part of it. Because it's a bigger part of their loan portfolio.
portfolio, you think? Yeah, and and it's an unusual part. Other banks won't do it as much. We wrote about two banks, uh, BOK Financial, which is Bank of Oklahoma, and um, Frost, which do major amounts of energy lending. I don't know, like, off the top of my head, but they both could be, like, top 10 type um, ones like that. Um, Our private client portfolio primarily consists of loans to wealthy individuals and their related oil and gas exploration and production entities. Yeah. So, and, um, you just get into detail. So like this whole section, I'm not going to read it all over on a podcast thing, but this is the part that I would read a lot about and be very interesting when they talk about how they make the loans and what types of, I mean, because let's talk, I mean, right. What does a bank do? They take in deposits and Mm -hmm. what do they do with that deposit? They, they loan it out Mm -hmm. to earn, to earn income. So yeah, you want to, um, you know, learn about the quality of those loans. Who are they loaning that money to the Mm -hmm. individuals? That's why you said the most important thing you think about with a bank is the deposits Mm -hmm. you know yeah which is a source of float by the way yeah and then they talk about their um, underwriting and the computer-based analysis, blah, blah, blah. But they talk about we maintain an independent loan review department and then they uh, credit risk and all that. And so they talk about the uh, how much they have in each category. The two categories that matter the most are commercial, industrial, and energy to them. Um, and then they talk about it, yeah. So have you ever looked at a company that does that? No, what's Like that? church loans and stuff? Yeah. Oh, got it. Churches usually have mortgages on them. So there's actually an entity that's a trust thing that people look at a lot, but it's complicated. We won't talk about there's it. There's a line that says religion. On, yeah. Uh, the, okay, large credit relationships. Talking about the number of relationships, 20 million or greater. Yeah, one that's unusual here, I guess. I mean, it's a small item. They're actually making um, 2% of their loans to financial services and consumer credit. It's possible that, you know, it's just worth mentioning that. Um, so, like, well, let's go up there to look at that just so we could think of what things are cyclical and what yep. things are counter cyclical mm-hmm. and stuff. So, what you want is so, like, here are the risks, for instance, as a Texas based business. Um, so, some of their industry concentrations, they have large concentration in energy and they have large concentration in public finance. I mean, not large, but it's 11% energy and it's like 5% in public finance. Um, remember that they also, in addition to that, have securities in Texas, right? Mm-hmm. So like they're buying uh, securities in Texas. Yeah. So in the late 80s, early 90s, there were some real problems with real estate values and things in Texas. If Texas has a um, Does the SNL that, crisis? Yeah, yeah, and with Texas specifically having to do with um, uh, energy stuff. So if Texas had something specifically that had to do with a big downturn in their housing and in their whatever land values and all that tied directly to like a collapse of energy prices or something, that would affect them a lot. I don't really believe Texas is that exposed like that under diversified anymore to those sorts of things. So I don't think something like what happened back then could ever happen again in Texas now, just because um, it's a very diversified economy now uh, compared to what it was. And I don't think that you'd have the downturn in real estate and stuff that you did, but it's worth looking at. Mm -hmm. Some of the things have no connection to that. So like medical services and stuff aren't, but you'd worry about things like energy, public finance, automobile dealers, uh, financial services, consumer credit. You just think, what if these things can all go wrong at the same time? Mm-hmm. Right. Then they also talk about just like, this should be the very large credit relationship. So let's go down to that one. Um, this gives you some idea of what they consider large and um, how many there are. So they have a number of relationships. So this gives you an idea that this is not a small bank. So if you just look at the first item, right, committed amount um, that they've, so they've, uh, will be willing to lend up to them uh, a certain amount. And then you have the outstanding amount, which is the actual amount that's, um, that someone is borrowing, drawing on the line or whatever, right? So the credit facilities that they have. So they have 261 relationships where they've committed to lend some... Uh, 20 million or greater. Probably yeah. a, a company. Um, more than $20 million. So that's pretty big. Uh, we know of banks where $20 million, uh, the bank... <laughs> is in a position to make a $20 million loan on their own, yeah. right? They need help from other banks to do that. So those are pretty big relationships. Um, and then you also have the 10 to $20 million range, which is another 179. And they give you some idea of how much that is. So like um, the outstanding amount right between those two, okay, is um, that's about one and a half and six and a half. So right there we're at about 8 billion, right? Mm-hmm. So there's actually 8 billion in loans outstanding that are loans of 10 million or more. Um, that's big. Remember, yeah. we saw how much the loans were. So these are big loans. This is not a company making small loans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
Let's see. This is interesting because we talked about commercial real estate and all that. Yeah. This actually gives you information about their exposure to real estate and what concentrations it is. So they're very exposed to office, office buildings. buildings yeah. yeah. And then they have office warehouse. They're much more exposed as compared to most uh, businesses that you're looking at to stuff that has to do with um, uh, sort of um, business stuff, like ongoing businesses mm-hmm. and things. And you would see, you tend to see more of this category of things like. Um, uh, one to four family construction they have at the bottom there mm-hmm. and multifamily and stuff like that you would see a lot more. Um, there are categories that no one knows what they mean, non-farm, non-residential. You'll see that in every bank. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there are other things that are very easy like you know dealerships, medical offices and services. Um, ones I would worry about here is if I saw big items in the multifamily Possibly, but probably not. But the two that would worry me are hotel and one to four family construction. So if I saw, those aren't big items here for them, but if I saw a bank making a ton of loans in hotel and one to four family construction, that could worry me a little bit. They're just like very specific sorts of things that could go bad. Geographic region. Yep. So we can see here. Antonio, Houston, Fort Worth, Dallas, Austin. Mm -hmm. The one thing that's kind of interesting, I I don't know if it's interesting or what. They have a fairly large amount of deposits in San Antonio relative to Houston, um, but they actually make plenty of loans in Houston. Um, so they have a lot of commercial real estate loans in Houston. The reason for that is probably because of the importance of like um, big energy companies in yeah. Houston, I would guess, is one of the reasons. Um, and this is sort of what we would normally expect. So the biggest, um, the five cities that they have down there, a lot of people put Fort Worth and Dallas together, but yeah. they don't. Um, San Antonio, Houston, Fort Worth, Dallas, Austin. Yeah, those would be the ones that you would expect. The only thing that's unusual here is Permian Basin, mm-hmm. and we know they acquired a bank that, that yeah. was their special. 2.7% in the Permian. Yeah, and that was a thing that they did a few years ago. Consumer loans, Yep. consumer real estate, uh, home equity loans, $375 million. Home equity lines of credit, $354 million. Total consumer real estate, $1.1 billion. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, they're just, it's an item that people might want to pay attention to. It doesn't matter for frost. They do have foreign loans. Um, there are some banks in like California, Texas, Florida, places like that, that may make loans to, um, borrowers in Mexico or in other places like that. Mm-hmm. Um, who are, you know, it's not a significant item here, but okay. Maturities and sensitivities of loans to changes in interest rates, obviously very yes. important. So we could you can uh, see how much a loan is due in one year or less or after yeah. one year, but within five years or after five years. Sure. So we got into all you could get into all this where you can you can probably look this up like on Wikipedia or something like that better than me trying to explain it to you. But cut the concept of duration and things like that. So an idea and they'll talk about that in earnings calls of how long on average their securities portfolio is and their loan portfolio. Um, the longer out it is, the more sensitive they're going to be generally Change to changes in interest rates and the less, the, curve. Uh, the less of the loans are going to come off into uh, the less liquid they are basically. So it's like owning a, a long bond portfolio. Whereas if you own like a short bond portfolio, and this is true for loans too, more of it's going to turn to cash faster. So it's like being more liquid that yeah. way. Obviously the, the, in many interest rate environments, you're not going to get as much interest being real short. So you're going to want to lend longer, but lending longer has some issues um, for liquidity risk that you have from that uh, because in theory you could lose your deposits. It doesn't worry me that much about something like frost or something like that. It really depends on the deposit versus the um, loan stuff and the security stuff. Um, I would worry a lot more if I felt that you were financing yourself with more wholesale stuff and things like that. So like um, wholesale deposits, so like hot money. Yeah, the, that becomes even more of an issue. If you had a lot of hot money, you'd want to have like really short um the duration mm-hmm. you want to have like you want to be really short in terms of loans and securities too but loans uh you don't want to like be taking in a lot of money that could go away next year and making 30 year loans with yeah it. yeah mm-hmm. non-performing assets and potential problem loans yeah so this is a breakdown of the non-performing of before yeah right and um it, it gives it detail on it in terms of like uh, we had percentages before accruing past due loans are a good example and um, the ratio of accruing past due loans to total loans, which you probably look at. So it gives you an idea of like, um, the, the big item that they talk about all the time will be the total um, loans and for total, so all the non-performing assets together as like a percentage versus loans is what they'll talk about. So total non-performing assets. 
that's generally what everyone will talk about. There's something called a Texas ratio. Again, you can look it up online, um, which gives you an indication of how safe a bank is and stuff. Maybe we could do that now. If you go online and you go to like Google or something, type in Texas ratio and t- t- type in Texas ratio deposit health or something like that. I think that will be one that might be easiest to find. Um, yeah, tr- click that first one and see. That might be a website that's good for it. Yeah. So this is a description of the... Um, it's only 2016. Okay. Um, Whoa. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So they're not bringing me to 2020. All right. But if you go up... Uh, yeah. So let's see. Um, wait. Go to the top again so you can see if you can search. Tr- yeah. Type in like Frost. Okay. See if you, yeah. See if you can find something on it. This might not be the best website for this, but yeah, click on Frostbank. And take me to the homepage. Yeah, there we go. So it gives a health rating. So um, do they have, let's see. All right, so click on the view health report just so I can see if someone's calculated this stuff for us so we can do it. Yeah, so let's, um, Texas ratio. Click on that. Yeah. A plus. Yeah, but it click on it. So yeah. So the Texas ratio is an indicator of how much capital a bank has available, and then it talks about it. So if you just go, it says that it, it, it two point okay. two eight. And what is considered likely to fail? Um, was this two point two eight or two point eight two? I'm sorry, is excellent. Right. Frost is two point eight two, and yeah. it, what's the threshold at which they, any bank with a Texas ratio near or greater than a hundred percent is right. considered at risk? Right. So it would have to be about thirty times higher to be considered at risk. Now I should say that's like seriously risky, but it's kind of like a Z score. Mm-hmm. If we've ever talked about that, like yeah, yeah. Z score, which is a bankruptcy predictor for um, non financial stocks, uh, you would want to look at the Texas ratio. There are other ways to do this yourself. There's nothing magic about the Texas ratio, but it was something that people know, and you can Google and you. Can can find out so i would just look at the texas ratio um and you know uh but as you can see the texas ratio the capitalization this site will give you information on that uh, the site itself i don't think really is helpful that much because yeah. it's like scaring people into thinking that if their bank is risky that they're not gonna get their deposits back mm-hmm. they're fdic insured and everything but for investors it's useful yeah, because yeah. it's giving you a better idea of the common stock because the common stock is the most junior security so it's the one that's actually at risk of all this stuff not you know the preferred stockholders the bond investors the uh, depositors who are well protected so anyway it's very safe so but you would look here and you mm-hmm. can see and it just supports the idea that we have that it's fairly safe mm-hmm. plenty of capital and not a lot of non-performing assets Allowance they get into loan detail of what they do for how they decide on allowance for loan losses. Generally, the stuff isn't that interesting for banks because they're fairly standard how they do it, I'd say. For like commer- uh, consumer finance companies and things like that, like yeah. companies that are making auto loans and subprime things and stuff, it can be a little more interesting because you can see that some of them write stuff off right away. Some of them take a very long time to write it off. They have kind of different <laughs> definitions of what a non-performing asset is and stuff like that. Um, securities? Yeah, securities. So you can see here that they're... Um, what they own. And so you see what's the overwhelm. Yeah. So, so 53% owns, is states and political subdivisions. Yes. 7 and billion. Do you remember where they said of that is Texas? I don't know. Majority. <laughs> 99.7. Yeah. All of yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> so the, basically 25% of their balance sheet or something incredible like that. Um, not quite that much cause it's, there's a held to maturity section. So we can't know that for sure, but something like 25% of this, um, bank's balance sheet is um, uh, bonds of the state of Texas. Yeah. Which would you consider safe? Yes. Yeah. I consider it super safe. But if they were bonds of the state of California or Illinois or New Jersey, I mean, yeah, not Illinois, right? Yeah. Um, but no, I would consider, honestly, I would consider so um, funny. So dead it, in it, Texas pretty so safe. Last time I went to Illinois, I drove past my old high school, and mm-hmm. next to my high school, there's an elementary school. And you know, like those signs they have as you drive by? Mm-hmm. It literally said, the state of Illinois owes us money. <laughs> they put that on the, on the thing. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I left this, this place. <laughs> Uh, so Not only is it cold, <laughs> but it's also... <laughs> Okay, I'm just going to be quiet. Uh, so if we go up a little bit, we can see uh, a little bit higher. Yeah, we can see the deposits. deposits yep. Yeah. So this gives a breakdown of the deposits, um, information on how much they have in each category, uh, and how much they pay on it. So um, they have savings and interest checking, money market, um, time accounts, and other things. So there's a... We talked a little bit about this when we were visiting bank and stuff. Um, what... Uh, there are different attitudes from regulators and from investors and stuff about what makes a bank safe and what doesn't. Um, and this is one where maybe I have a little disagreement with some things, which is that I think 
that um, having somewhat seasoned deposits of um, like your basic interest stuff of households and businesses is by far the safest way to finance a bank. So if they haven't grown their deposits tremendously in the last couple of years, right? If their deposits are pretty flat this year or the year before, whatever. Yeah. And so they mostly are made up of customers who've been their customers for a couple of years or more who are businesses and households, I think those are very, very safe to have that all in checking and stuff. Now, in theory, they're not safe because some of that, they're, that's why they call them demand deposits. You can literally Take withdraw them. Now. You can yeah. force the bank to give it to you and and pretty much immediately. Customer demand deposits. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so other money is locked up longer. This is where they talk about time accounts of 100000 or more and stuff like that. I worry about those because I don't know about them rolling over in the future and that it's more important what rates are paid on them and things like that. So I generally favor the top part of what you're seeing here, the savings and interest checking part, which pays very low um, rates mm-hmm. and is generally you know safer. And to me in terms of that, I think that I know what the balance sheet of the bank will look like over time. Mm-hmm. So I prefer that part from a regulatory perspective and stuff though. There is some things about in theory, people could pull all that. So, um, some people, you know, whatever, some people like the, the, um, time deposits more than mm-hmm. I do. They, do, I don't like them that much. So got it. And then he, here you have, um, uh, Okay, so you can see this is the other part that I like, so it breaks this down. So here you can see that it's almost all stuff I like to see. So Frost gets 95% of those um, deposits. Now these are the interest bearing, uh, but uh, they get 95% of the deposits basically from who I want them to, which is commercial and individual. Public funds would mean like um, local governments and mm-hmm. things like that. And then correspondent banks is because um, the fr- Frost is doing correspondent banking, like we said. Some t- banks you won't see any item listed there. But so what... what funds are coming from other financial institutions and from governments is only 5%. Most of it is coming from individuals and um, businesses who I think are likely to leave it mm-hmm. with the bank that they have. And I think you're generally the primary relationship that they have. Sure. Whereas like for other ones, I'm not as sure that you're the primary relationship. Okay. They break it down by yep. um, the geographic Geogra- concentration yeah. of the total deposits. So this is one I mentioned before. Notice that San Antonio is a big chunk of deposits not quite as much of loans, if you'll remember. Yeah, it was like 27%. But or the big difference, right, is Houston. Yeah. So Houston is right up there with San Antonio and Total Reserve loans, but not in terms of deposits. Mm-hmm. Now, I know they're trying to make a big push into that area, but this is also where um, you can see why the area that we live in doesn't have as much. Frost is only has. Um, gets a small amount. So Frost only gets 8% of their deposits from Dallas. You can imagine that Dallas probably makes up more than 8% of the um, market in mm-hmm. Texas for uh, deposits. So they have fairly low market share in, mm-hmm. in Dallas, right? Yeah, you don't see a lot of nope. Frost uh, branches here at all. No. Nope. Short-term borrowings would be important, except this uh, they don't have short-term borrowings of the kind that would worry me, so we could just skip it for this. Uh, off-balance sheet agreements are kind of big for banks. So Yeah, 4.7 billion. Yeah, so when you talk about 10K st- stuff, we often say, like, off-balance sheet agreements, we'd like to see that it says Nothing. there's none. Yeah. Uh, but banks are always going to have really big ones. Um, the, the biggest commitment that they're going to have is just this item where it says other commitments, commitments to extend credit. Okay? 3.6 billion for people yeah. listening. So and their total and three point eight right their total over all periods is nine point some billion right yeah but we saw that earlier that's where they uh, have those relationships of like twenty million dollars or something mm-hmm. or more where someone's borrowing say twenty million and the business could borrow fifty million yeah they're obligated they can't say no we're not giving you the other thirty million and that's what they're talking about so that's off balance sheet because it's not on the balance sheet that commitment but they've promised that and you're used to seeing it from the other perspective of the ten k where. Uh, um, the borrower is who you're investing in, mm-hmm. and they say, "Oh, we can draw another, you know, two hundred million on our line of credit." So this is the other side of that. Capital and liquidity. Yep, this is. Kind of went over a lot of this. Complicated, and we could get into. I. Um, this is a lot of boilerplate and stuff. I wouldn't worry about it. Like I said, we talked about like their health and their capitalization. Go so, to a page that talks about the Texas ratio, things like that. Learn about that more than trying to find about like the regulator perspective. So then here we have the auditing. Um, one thing that's different. Uh, let's see. Okay. One thing that's different is um, so they've been auditing. Do you see how long they started as the company's auditor? Yeah, since 1969. Yeah, they're in, so it's Ernst and Young since 1969, and it's San Antonio. So those are all good things. I like to see that. Yeah. Oh, one thing I point out for smaller banks is sometimes you get to see the auditor. I would look at who else they audit. 
I like to see when I have a small auditor, I don't recognize the name very much, um, that they spe- basically specialize in doing a lot of bank audits. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't like to see someone auditing a banker and insurer who doesn't normally do that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, balance sheet. Um, so the balance sheet is very important. It's annoying that we have these lines here, but, yeah. uh, so what we'll do is some math here. Unfortunately, we don't have a calculator. Are we pull uh, it up? You want, need to pull up a calculator? Okay, we'll do that. Okay. All right. So, um, let's start with the, um, total deposits. Okay. So total deposits. Where are we at? 27.6 here? billion we here. Okay. Liabilities. It's the third line. Yep. Yep. Hold on. Let me move this. I'm trying to get this. I don't know how to make this look, uh pretty for them okay okay we'll do 27.6 okay okay all right so then we're going to go to the um uh income statement if we scroll down so i'm just going to remember 27.6 but keep that on there yeah so we have total interest expense and we have total non-interest income okay. now, there's actually some items that i want to remove from there but to do the math we're not going to take them out okay so the thing i would normally remove is the net gain loss on securities transactions and uh, but we're not going to worry about that here. So what I want to do that's twenty seven point six billion. We just said yeah. what I'd actually do is average the year before twenty eighteen and twenty nineteen. So for I, the total customer deposits for the deposits. Yeah. So we said twenty seven point six. The item from the year before would be smaller probably because the deposits grew. You average them out and you get an average number. We're going to just skip that just to do this quickly. So the uh, if we go down, you have net non interest income is three hundred sixty three million. Uh, yep. Right. And then you have non interest expense. So if you go down. That's uh, 834 million. Okay. So I want you to take 834. Uh, or, okay. Okay. You eight, could take 0. 0.834, actually. 0. 0.834. Okay. okay. Um, minus 0. 0.363. Oops. Okay. Equals. I'm doing this on my Surface tablet. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. And then so 471 so million. 471 million. And then we're going to divide that by what we just said, which was the 27.6 million. Was 27.6 yeah. billion? Yes. Yeah, so. Okay. So divided by 27.6 equals. Then we're going to multiply that by 100 to get a percentage. And now people can see what the um, net non interest expense is versus deposits. And it's okay. about 1.7%, right? Okay. okay. So explain. So for the people. What that means is that that's the amount that they are um, that it costs them to bring in deposits that isn't the interest part of the cost. One point seven percent. Yes. Now there we simplified some things and whatever, but yes. And um, you want an all-in cost that's pretty low. Uh, so then we can also take the interest cost. So the total interest expense that you have here on deposits okay. is all that we care about. So that's zero point nine nine seven four two. So I'm going to just say zero point one. Okay. Okay. And then you're going to divide that by what do we say? Twenty-seven point six yep. billion. Okay. Time multiply that by hundred. 0.36. Yeah. So we take 0.36, we add it to 1.7, and which was our number four, and we get 2.06. Yeah. That's roughly about what I would say that it costs them as their cost of funding, right? Mm-hmm. So if you think about it, like that's like a insurer having a combined ratio of 102. Uh-huh. It's like a hedge fund being able to borrow at 2% forever. Got it. Things like that. Now it'll fluctuate depending on the um, interest rates, but not a lot for this bank because this bank um, isn't going to have interest rates go up a lot um, on their side. The interest rates going up would benefit Frost more than most banks. So because they have such low, they pay such, such a small amount of interest on their deposits. Um, but that's a very good number. And this now makes sense, which we'll see later in terms of the ROA. So the ROA is really, let's say, hypothetically, let's do, um, let's say you take 3.5, let's say, and let's round that to 2.1 because we said 2.06 so yeah. 3.5 minus 2 point um, the cost right 2.1, the all in yeah, cost the all in yeah. cost of funding and then let's multiply that by let's say times um, 0. Uh, 0.79 to what? give an idea of taxes just normal taxes okay that would give you 1.1% so let's say it could be 1% or something so all they really have to do in theory is um, be able to lend 
all the time or buy securities all the time that have a yield of three and a half percent. That's about what they need. Mm -hmm. So we could see that three and a half, four percent, they're doing well. If we used four percent instead, um, it would be four percent minus the two point one percent that we had. And then, you know, you go from there and you get a number that's even closer to like one and a half percent. And then that would be like times 10 if they're working at a normal leverage ratio. So we want to find what the number is that would be required to get them like a, maybe a 10% or higher return on equity. Because uh-huh. that's kind of your threshold number that you need as an investor. You want to make 10% or better in a stock. Yeah. So just like, can this long-term create value? Yes, if it has an all-in cost of funding of like 2% or so. Mm-hmm. Um, if it had three or more, it starts to get harder. And if it had four, that's too high. You know, um, so you want something in the three percent, two percent range. I'd like it more closer to two percent. We've there are banks that are even lower than that, um, high ones and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And that's really what I care about is the all-in cost of the um, financing. Uh, the, the other thing, uh, the cost of the funding um, here is that obviously it's mostly non-interest. Mm-hmm. So interest rates are going to affect them less, which is interesting because of course it means the banks can be at its worst when interest rates are really low because they can't eliminate their uh, non-interest expenses. So one thing that you'd also see here is when comparing it to another bank, um, you know, let's say you had an attitude, uh, like a, um, you had a prediction about where interest rates were going to go or something. You've said, what could be mispriced? Probably what people might misprice is like a bank that's getting mostly non-interest uh, cost of funding, right? Mm-hmm. And another bank is mostly interest-based. They might overvalue the bank that's all interest-based, Right. And like, so a bare bones bank that's very cheap about everything and stuff, but pays pretty high interest rates normally, they might overvalue that in today's environment. Sure. And they might undervalue something like Frost. Uh So you want to look for things that most of their expenses are not interest based because interest rates are so low that That when rates rise, theoretically. Yeah. Mm Because people tend to focus too much on the very recent past, like the last five years or something. So you'd probably want to look more at banks now that have, um, that are weighted more towards having high non interest expenses and fairly low interest expenses. Because it's the, something that someone might overlook mm-hmm. now on the chance that interest rates might go higher or something. Sure. Whereas you want to avoid the opposite, which is that the only reason the bank is really successful today is because it's paying really low interest rates because it, everyone's paying really low interest rates, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so obviously the total deposits, that's one of the most important things on uh, as the liability for the, uh, of the balance sheet. Okay. Mm-hmm. What about... Um, what else we got here? So we have Where some federal funds purchase and repurchase agreements. Yeah. I'll give you the one that most investors will be really interested in. I'm not so much. But it's just we can do tangible equity. So let's go down to total shareholders equity. Okay. That's $3.9 billion. Yep. You can do that with the calculator. $3.9 billion. And then we just subtract from that um, uh, the goodwill, which is 0. 0.645. 645. Yeah. And then we would also take out the other intangibles net, but I don't think that's a big item, so I don't think it, it matters if I'm reading that right. It's like two million. Yeah, two point four. Yeah, so let's just do that. So just equals. So just say equals, and that's three point two five. Mm-hmm. And then you would just need to know the number of shares outstanding, which it should have on this page as well. We I it was like sixty. Um, Sixty four point. Two three yeah. six. Yeah. So divided by six. So first multiply this by a thousand. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, divide that by 64 uh, point point two three six. I think we did it right. Yeah. Customer dot. Oh, yeah, yeah. There you go. So it has about $50 a yeah. share, $51 a share in tangible equity. Book value, yeah. Yeah. And the bank is trading at about twice that number, right? Yeah, it was 93. <clears throat> yeah. So to a lot of people, that would say this is an expensive bank. I, as you know, don't care that much about tangible equity. I don't think it's as important as people think in terms of because the value of the deposits is so different depending on the bank. So I think what's more important is the price to the deposit. So why don't we do that? Okay. So the um, bank has, uh, let's see. So we just take total deposits here so 67 so take 27.6 27.6 divided by 64.236 sorry should we multiply by a thousand yeah you should multiply by a thousand sorry just so people know we're multiplying by a thousand because we're taking a number in uh, billions and translating to a different number in millions three nine multiply by a thousand okay and then you're going to divide by 64.236 36 yeah, four hundred thirty dollars. So then you take today's stock price. What'd you say it was? Ninety three. Okay, so take ninety. So take four hundred. Uh, sorry, take ninety three, and divide by four hundred thirty. And that's the number that's really surprising me. I think I think that's what. Let me double okay. check. 
So the number that he just got that's surprising me is a number that's close yeah, to 0. 0.2. Um, 0. 0.2 times price to deposits for a bank that has as good deposits as Frost has it's is cheap. shockingly yeah. low. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would have expected it. I would expect a bank to be in the 0. 0.2 to 0. 0.4 range probably, but much more than the 0. 0.3, 0. 0.35. And this is the way that Buffett thinks about it too when he buys banks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's just... Uh, it's cheaper than I thought it would be and to, just because deposits have continued to increase over time and stuff. Um, you can also just do it versus like things like um, the total earning assets, which is the other way of doing mm -hmm. it and stuff, but we're just doing it by the deposits. Um, th they'll be pretty similar. So, uh, Anyway, it's pretty cheap. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's sort of like people talk about PEs and price to book and stuff. I'd rather use price to deposits and then worry about the quality of the deposits. It's kind of like if I was doing a... a an insurance company, right? Yeah. I would look at the price to the premiums, right? Or And then look at the um, the combined ratio the, the type, together. Uh -huh. I don't and wanna, the type of premiums that they are. Right. But if the combined ratio is bad, I really don't want to pay any... There, there's not a price at which I really want to buy the insurance company. Mm -hmm. if, it, if it's good, um, then I'm willing to pay a pretty high price versus it. So it's the combination of those two things. So what's surprising me is not that you can buy it at 0 0.2 times deposits, although that's a low price for a bank, I think. Um, it's that those aren't high cost deposits. We just said that those are deposits like 2% funding all if you in. think about yeah. it. I mean, if you think about it, what you were saying is you, so you're paying 0 0.2, mm -hmm. right, for the stock. So that means we're getting five times leverage by buying into, if you want to think about it, like look through, I'm buying into this bank, what am I getting? Yeah. I'm getting five times leverage by buying the common stock because it's 0 0.2, that's the price I'm paying. So I'm getting five times leverage through the deposits by doing this. And I'm getting it at 2% funding. Mm -hmm. So it's as if someone's letting me borrow at 2% and I can leverage something up five times. And what I'm leveraging up, of course, is these state of Texas bonds mm -hmm. and these uh, commercial mortgages and things like that. But basically, it's a more attractive way of buying them than buying them directly, right? So they're not necessarily attractive assets. They aren't. They don't have good yields, as we'll see in a second. But because I'm getting this leverage from buying at such a cheap price versus deposits, and because the price that I'm funding myself at is low, it becomes attractive. That's what makes a bank attractive. Or bank stock attractive, mm -hmm. is those two things. You, if you pay too high a price to deposits, this wouldn't work. Uh, don't worry about the cash flow statement. I really don't want to talk about the cash flow statement with that. So, I mean, we can look at it for a second just so that people see yeah. it. Um, but I always get asked about information about what, like people talk to me about the cash flow statement of a bank. It's really not helpful. There's just a few items you take out of the income statement. That's what you want to use. Um, so I would definitely do that instead. I, I wouldn't rely on information from the cash flow statement. I also think it can be confusing because people can sometimes think that it's attractive uh, when it's at its worst point because it's easier to bring in positive cash flow with a financial institution, bank or insurance company, mm -hmm. uh, when you're in trouble. Uh, it's not like a manufacturer or something. It can not be a good sign sometimes when cash flow goes up. Footnotes. Securities. Mm -hmm. So this just gives you information. I mean, the thing that people probably look at is like... Um, uh, how much they have on the uh, like mark to market losses? Is there a way to turn this off? There's got to be. This way is so annoying. <laughs> so What's this thing do? Maybe this does it. Nope. Just kidding. Okay. Okay. Oh. Okay. All right. Um. So you can anyway. That's the bond portfolio. You can go down further. Uh, it does give information about the. Um, here we go. This is the important one. So this is um, the uh, due in one year or less, due after one year through five years, and so on. Um, so they have no equity securities, which isn't that surprising for a bank. Uh, some do, but it's not surprising. And then um, the other information they have is the- They have some for sale. That's available immature. for sale. Yeah. Yeah. It's so small, though. Um, and then- you have the ones do one year, then one through five, five through 10, and over 10. As you'll notice, there's like none in less than a year, basically. They have some in the available for sale. Um, but you, you just have a, um, a lot in the uh, one to 10 year, and you can see that it sort of bulges out more in the five to 10, as we'd see if we added those together. So there's information about that. Probably in the earnings call, they talk about the duration stuff all the time, so I wouldn't be um, necessarily having to use the 10K to figure that out. Going over the loans again. Um, a lot of the, we don't have to worry about that. Yeah. So here we have some specific things about how past due the loans are, which can be useful. So, um, 
they have uh, loans that are 30 to 90 days past due and that are more than 90. So more than 90 would be pretty serious. Usually, it depends. We talked about like Farmer Mac and stuff. It's common for farm loans to be more than 90 days past due without a problem. It's not so common for like a consumer loan to be more than 90 days past due without the fact that it's going to um, not be collectible. Uh, and so here it just has the information broken down by what industry it's in. Um, uh, they have a lot, uh, not a lot, but they had a fair amount, as you could see, of like um, construction loans that are past due 90 days or less. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't like to see a bank that had a, a bunch of their loans tied to construction. No, that's it, especially because like type. the bank is likely to get into trouble at the same moment yeah. that the construction loans get into trouble. Yeah. Uh, if you go up a little bit, we're not going to do the risk grades, but if you go up a little bit, they talk about restructured loans and things mm-hmm. like that. Um, so they go into lots of detail about that. Some of the interesting things are when they get into the number of loans. So if we see, let's see if they can do that for us. If we go further down, down. Uh, further number of loans right here. Yeah. So restructured loans past due in excess of 90 days, a period oh end. Gosh. they talk about the number and then the volume. So like in one case they had, is that a one I see in 2017? Yep. So that is obviously one forty-three million dollar loan. So I'm just just wanted to give you yeah, an idea of the this is size of loans. them. Yeah, the, how big these loans are. They can be fairly big for Frost. You said we're not going to get into the risk grade, but they talk about how they grade it and stuff. So you could um, uh, get some idea of that. I mean, I would read that section, but I just don't want to get into a lot of the risk grade stuff here. Um, then they, this is the specific stuff. So this is interesting. If you go up, okay. Uh, this says the, fo- the following table details. If you go up a little bit more, it'll break the, the uh, following table details, activity and allowance for loan losses by portfolio segment for 2019, 2018, 2017 allocation of a portion of the allowance to one category of loans does not preclude its availability to absorb losses in other categories. Right. So they do it as an overall bucket sort of thing. And, um, the, if we look here, what you'll see is that the um, it's sort of the development of the loan losses mm-hmm. um, versus the actual uh, um, allowances that they're making. So if we look, we'll see the beginning balance and then whether it goes up or down over time. So they have the provision for loan losses, right? Mm-hmm. And they have the charge-offs. If the provision for loan losses is under the charge-offs, right, then absent the recoveries, which is an item that you'll see, um, then you would have net charge-offs, right? So what we care about is the net charge-offs mm-hmm. part of it. Um, and that's what you'll see normally. Net charge-offs do, is net of the recoveries, though. So, um, so like, for instance, they recovered four, uh, uh, what did they recover? Four million on, uh, in that category, CNI. Um, so sometimes they have things that are charged off that then they recover. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we look here, we see the one, this is, um, we have 2019, 2018, 2017. You can see it by category and how big the differences are. I would just pay attention to things like whether it seems like one of those two numbers, provision for loan losses or charge-offs, let's ignore recoveries, um, is much bigger than the other and whether it keeps happening in one um, category. So um, you would see like the, in other words, you, but the other way of looking at it is you could just look at the balances to see if the balance is going up or down over time. Um, it's not letting me not <laughs> highlight it. <laughs> okay. So uh, you can move down from this then. Okay, deposits. So it, it just gives details about <clears throat> public funds and private funds. They'll break that down all the time. And they also, I think, have this in like the call report, if I remember right. Um, and it just gives you an idea of the size of each of those that we talked about. We already talked about how I like to see the household and uh, business loans, uh, business deposits, um, in, rather than like uh, from other banks or from uh, public money. Um, the borrowed fund stuff isn't going to be that interesting for this, but it will talk about the preferred stock, right? Mm-hmm. Um, does it talk about that here? Oh, yeah. So they talk about where they acquired uh, other bank and stuff so because they bought WMB. So off balance sheet, we pretty much went over all this. Yeah, Let's capital and regulatory. So here, if you wanted the breakdown of the actual ratios and stuff, they have it. As you'll notice, there's not a big difference between Cullen Frost and Frost Bank. Uh, that right, that's very yeah, small very, all the time. The so you're basically looking. At what you'll notice if we do a like call report or something, if you look at it, is that it's going to be very similar to the numbers in the 10K. 
um, because what we're dealing with here is basically a bank that has one um, bank. So that's the preferred stock. Mm-hmm. So it talks about it. So there's going to always be preferred stock probably in a bank that you look at, almost always. Um, and you'll just get into the details of that. I don't think it it's not that important. It doesn't work like preferred stock that you would have for a um, non-financial company. It's just not as interesting. Usually it's a much bigger deal if you see preferred stock in a non-financial company. Um, it's often just done for regulatory purposes. And then just valuation, fair value measurements. Yep. These are typical things that you see for everybody. So we can skip these because they're not particular to uh, stock based yeah, compensation. Yeah, the stuff that isn't specific to a bank here. Um, okay, so this is some of this is other non interest income and expense. Uh, the only ones that are that interesting are like professional services and stuff but most of the others aren't it's you could be useful to see the size of it um they advertise a bit more than others so Mm -hmm. um but that's all a lot of banks don't advertise much at all income taxes Mm -hmm. so this can matter but we looked at the balance sheet already so comprehensive income loss just will give you an idea of stuff that doesn't pass through the net income statement but um, it's stuff that we've already dealt with in like the balance sheet. Um, but that's okay. Then we have the derivatives. So this does matter to read these sections. Um, so if you go a little bit higher, um, these items can be really big for banks. So um, they talk about we utilize interest rate swaps, caps and floors, and all of that. Um, this is typical for banks to say that they do all of this stuff. Um, they following table. And then here we go. So um, the derivatives that they have, let's see what's interesting here. Um, I don't see anything that I want to talk about really in this section. Uh, let's see. No. There's, you can look at the interest rates offset. Probably commodity derivatives, derivatives, right? Um, let's see here what they say about it. So why do they say about their commodity derivatives? It says we enter into commodity swaps and option contracts that are not designated as hedging instruments primarily to accommodate the business needs of our customers. Upon the origination of a commodity swap or option contract with a customer, we simultaneously enter into an offsetting contract with a third-party financial institution to mitigate the exposure to fluctuations in commodity prices. So... Uh, basically, we don't have to care about this, so we can skip that. <laughs> <laughs> if it works as intended, that's <laughs> that's the issue that I should say with all of these derivatives that we're skipping over. Uh, we don't have to care about it if they're correct about the assumptions yeah, that they're making. To, it doesn't matter until it, it does. It, it doesn't no, matter kidding. if it they're matters. if they're correct in that they're offsetting it. Uh, the same thing as it doesn't if when they tell you that they're hedging something to hedge a currency and we say, okay, so they're hedging the currency. They can be wrong about what they're doing. Um, and let's see. Okay, so we can move down from here. I don't care about any of those things. Don't care about this. Um, okay. Fair value measurements. This is, uh, I don't know if we've ever talked about level one, level two, level three stuff, but it won't matter for a lot of the, a lot of theirs will be level one inputs. A few will be level two, right? So the level one stuff is going to be all the government things. Uh, federal government things and the level two inputs will be all of the state and what's level one uh we can go up scroll up and i can give you an exact definition for level one yeah uh unadjusted quote prices in active markets for identical assets or liabilities that the reporting entity has the ability to access so they're using the treasury market for that the reason why it won't work for level two we could read level two um, inputs that other than quota prices, including level one, that are observable for the asset or liability, either directly or indirectly. These might include, can you read that? Quoted prices for similar assets or liabilities in active markets. Quoted prices for identical yes. or similar assets or liabilities in markets that are not active. I don't think that the markets are active enough in the um, municipal bond stuff as compared to the treasury stuff to use the uh, uh, unadjusted quoted price all the time for them. So it's not weird though. Lots of people have, there's quotes available for, it's not hard to get a quote on a uh, municipal bond. So that's not weird. Uh, Level three would be like what we talked about Burford. Mm -hmm. So almost all their balance sheet would be level three. Yeah. Yeah. We need like a third party. It's unobservable. Yeah, yeah, Mm -hmm. exactly. Operating segments. We pretty much went into all this. Let's see what else we got here. Condensed balance sheet, mm-hmm. cash. We did the whole balance sheet, so we don't need to 
do any of that stuff. Got it. All right. Let's just wrap up here. What okay. are the three things <laughs> you guys that were almost two hours long? What are the big takeaways that you look for in a bank, right? Just to bring it all home. The big calculation that we did is what is the makeup of the deposits? Um, so the type of deposits. The type of deposits. Um, then what are the type of loans that they make? The type of loans. And when he says type of deposits, right? right. If you are if you have wholesale deposits, for mm -hmm. example, that's probably considered more hot money. Easy come, easy right. go type of thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the types of loans that they're making, right? right. You could... You could see that and we'll do a FDIC call report as well and get a little bit more in depth okay. uh, probably next week because I'm a little bit over this bank but no okay. it's good um, but like if they're loaning to like construction and stuff like that yes. if a huge part of their portfolio is is to construction you probably aren't going to like that um, you did note that I would always for, check the Texas ratio. So yeah, okay. that's, that's one thing that I would just, we showed you that on the YouTube video, how you could check that at one place. If you don't know anything else about how to evaluate the safety of a bank and stuff, at least check the Texas ratio and know the difference between you're looking at a bank that has a number that's like close to 0% or a number mm -hmm. that's like close to 100. At least that'll give you information about whether this bank is seriously troubled or not. What was interesting was that their, um, the loans for mortgages, they don't have any. Yes, or really, and that's what I talk about. The, like the consumer yeah. part of it is that the bank really is not doing a lot of consumer lending. Yeah. So you just have to look at it comparing to a lot of different banks and see what's different about it. They're doing less consumer lending. They're doing more energy lending. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah, and they're owning a lot more municipal bonds of uh, t Texas bonds, right? Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and myself. If you are still awake on the longest podcast that we've ever recorded, my name is Andrew Kuhn. His name is Jeff Gannon. This is the number one value investing podcast in the world, soon to be the number one YouTube channel in the world, and on our way to being the number one educators on the internet in the value investing space. I want to thank everybody so much. We're coming up on our two-year anniversary, which is crazy in itself. Um, we thank everybody so much for the support. A rating and review goes a very long way for for us. Anytime you hit that thumbs up button, it goes a very long way for us. And anytime you leave us a r actual review on the podcast side or comments, it all goes a long way for us. And we uh, have a business model based on goodwill that if we put out good content, good things come from it. So I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in. We will see you in the next podcast. Take care. Hey, this is Andrew Kuhn, and that was the Focus Compounding Podcast, the podcast where Jeff and I talk about actionable stock ideas, investing concepts, and the overall way that we think about investing at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Go to focuscompounding.com and enter in your email to get a free watch list from Jeff every other week. And be sure to check out all of our other work where Jeff writes about stocks at focuscompounding.com. I upload how-to investing videos on YouTube, and we both manage capital for investors at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Thanks for listening and be sure to subscribe to follow along.